Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. I'm glad that you've tuned in tonight. We just want to thank you for being part of this. And let me say this, a very special thank you for those of you who are regularly contributing to Liberty Baptist Church. Your continued offerings allow us to continue to minister to people on a regular basis. We've got a couple of special songs, and then we're going to be talking about how uh, eight rules to have a happy life. You'll enjoy this message. I know it'll be an encouragement to you. So uh, sit back, relax, enjoy the music, and then I hope you'll enjoy the preaching. How can I keep from praising your name? There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? from singing your praise how can i ever say enough how amazing is your love how can i keep from shouting your name i know i am loved by the king and it makes my heart want to sing then sings my soul
unto thee. Tonight, I want to talk to you about eight rules for a happy life. We're going to be in James chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. What is it that makes you happy? I just had a birthday, and people sang to me, happy birthday. They gave me a card, and inside that card was a gift certificate to go to Outback Steakhouse with, the house with my wife and just enjoy a wonderful meal. Now, that will make me happy. Uh, what is it that makes you happy? What, what is it that brings joy into your life? In this passage of Scripture, God is going to give us eight rules that will help us form a happy life. These are rules that we, if we apply them to our life and we, uh, and we live by them, we can have a life filled with joy, a life that is happy. Let's look at what James says. He says in verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and let your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou be a judge of the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say, to today or, or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Eight rules for a happy life. Father, I pray that you'd teach us some things this evening. I pray that you'd help us to take these truths, help us to apply them to our lives, help us to see that it is obedience to your word that will bring true joy, true happiness in our life, and help us to apply these things so that we can be effective for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God wants us to have joy. That does not mean there's not going to be trials in our life. It doesn't mean that we're, that we're not going to have problems in our life, but God wants us to know how to have joy, how to be happy in the midst of trials. This passage gives us eight rules that if we'll follow, we can be happy, we can be content, we can have joy even in the midst of trouble. Let's look at them. Number one, he says in verse 8, draw nigh to God. You know, we're in the midst of a pandemic, and people are always talking about, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Look, let me tell you one thing you should do, and you should do this on a daily basis. You need to draw nigh to God. Look what he says. He says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Then he says how to do that. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He addresses us, and these are believers, so he's addressing us as believers, and he's saying, hey, what you need to do is cleanse your hands, you sinner. 
And when you got saved, your heart was cleansed from all sin. You're, you're, you're made new in the sight of God. But the Bible tells us that we struggle with sin, and you and I know that we struggle with sin every day. Things come into our life. God wants us to cleanse our hands. God wants us to come to him and confess our sin. And that's how we get clean before God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I want to be right before God, if I want to draw an eye to God, the first thing I'm going to have to do is confess my sin. You can't walk in the presence of pure righteousness without coming to him, confessing your sin. Every day, what I do is I get down before God, I kneel before Him, and I put my face to the ground. When I do that, I worship Him. God wants us to worship Him. Um, when, I, when I'm there before Him, I say to Him, God, I want you to know I'm thankful for what you've given to me, and I thank Him for several things. And then I praise Him. I tell Him how wonderful He is, and then I confess my sin to Him. My sin is, is a basic sin. It's selfishness. It's self-centeredness. I believe that self-centeredness and selfishness is the root of all sin in our life. The Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of money. That is that selfish, greedy desire for yourself. Wanting money so you can get things for yourself. That's the root of all evil. It's the, it's the desire to be something that caused uh, problems for Lucifer, caused him to fall. I will be like the Most High God. Well, here in this passage, we see the very first rule of happiness is this. We need to draw nigh to God. When we draw an eye to God, the first thing that's going to do, we're going to do is we're going to see ourselves as sinful. We need to confess those sins. But then we need to spend time with Him. Spend time daily with God. What a privilege it is. Think about this. God is asking you to come and spend time with Him. If you got a phone call from some famous person and they said, hey, I just want you to come and spend time with me. Man, how quickly would you get uh, to a plane or get to a car or do whatever you needed to do to get over and spend time with him? Here you have the creator of the universe saying, draw nigh to me. Come close to me. There is a joy that comes into the life of the believer when you spend time with him. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in his church. It's so important. Satan does everything he can to keep believers away from church. We see that going on today in our world. We see a, a, we see a, a forbidding of going to church. It's important that we church. The word church means to assemble. It's important that we get together with other believers. I'm going to be speaking about that this coming Sunday. The local assembly is God's plan for the strengthening of believers. The local assembly is the body of Jesus Christ. When we're not in church, we're not drawing close to him. The Bible says, look, draw nigh to me. That would mean daily spending time in prayer. That would be daily thanking Him. That would be daily praising Him. That's daily worshiping Him. That's going before Him. What a privilege to be able to go to the one that controls everyone and spend time with Him. He's in control of all things, and we have the opportunity of being with Him. Now, when we go before Him, we confess our sin. And He says, purify your hearts. That is, don't just look good on the outside, but look good on the inside. Confess your inward sin. Now, here's the promise. I love this promise. You, there, there are fearful things that are going on all around us. There's wickedness that's going on all around us. We, we are hearing about, wow, look at how bad things are. We talk about the problems in, in the economy. We talk about the problems in society. We, we see we see rioting, we see chaos going on. How can you have peace? I'll tell you, I can have peace. You draw nigh to God, and here's the promise. He'll draw nigh to you. 
you will know the presence of God in your life. And when you have that presence of God in your life, you're going to have peace. You're going to have joy. You're going to have that in your life. You're going to have that happiness because you're going to be in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So number one, he says, draw nigh to God. That's the first principle. The second is this. The second principle is be afflicted and mourn and weep. Well, you look at that, you say, wait a minute. How does that equate to happiness? Mourning uh, over uh, uh, and grieving seem like the opposite of happiness. Look, what he's talking about is grieving over sin in your life. Verse 9 says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. And uh, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. What he's talking about is grieving over sin. You know, the Bible tells us that fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous, there is favor. He's not talking about living a mournful life, not enjoying life. He's talking about the fact that we should not be laughing as the world does about infidelity, about drunkenness, about drug abuse. There's there are people who have made uh, a living in comedy, mocking drunks, mocking. There was a, a group when I was a teenager called Cheech and Chong, and their whole deal was making, they made records about, a record is like a CD, uh, but much bigger. They, they, make, they, they, made, they mocked drug addicts and how, how people on marijuana uh, act and and they they mocked sin. Comedians for years have mocked drunks and what drunks do. But I want you to understand, drunkenness is not is no laughing matter. Just this morning, I was told by Pastor Neil about a a, a wreck that he had to go t to. A little baby under two years old was killed because his mother, who was drunk. A drunk driver driving 120 20 miles an hour in a, in a uh, just not far from the church here, uh, ran a stop sign, got hit, and totally, and the, the child flew from the, from the uh, car, killed the baby instantly. These people are in mourning. Drunkenness is no joke to them. Drunkenness is no joke to the mother who goes to the hospital because her baby boy has been beaten to death by her drunken husband. Drunkenness is no joke to the family who uh, has lost everything because of the alcoholic mom or dad. Drunkenness is no joke. Gambling is no joke. Infidelity is no joke. Immorality is no joke. Pornography is no joke. We need to weep and mourn over these things. We need to fast and pray for uh, our country. These, these, these things have torn our country apart. We need to understand that. For years, people laughed and mocked uh, homosexual behavior. It's no laughing matter. It's a horrible sin against God and against, the, against uh, nature for a, a man to sleep with a man or a woman to sleep with a woman. This is, this is totally and completely contrary to God. It's nothing to mock, nothing to joke about. We need to be careful about allowing ourselves to take these things lightly. The Bible tells us again that fools make a mock at sin but among the righteous there is favor. So if I really want to have joy in my life, if I really want to have happiness in my life, number one, I need to draw nigh to God. Number two, I need to be afflicted and mourn and weep over sin, sin that's in our world and sin that is in my life. Allow God to break my heart over sin so that 
I won't be involved in this. You need to understand it is sin that sentences people to hell forever, separated from God. And there's only when we are forgiven of our sins through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Third, third thing he says is in verse 10. He says in verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. God wants us to humble ourselves before him. Now what does that mean? That very simply means I need to get alone with God, as I said a minute ago, confess my sin to him, recognize who God is, recognize that I can do nothing of myself, but I can do all things through him. Being humble before God doesn't mean that I do nothing. It means that I stop trusting in myself and I start trusting in him. I realize my inadequacies and I recognize that he has it all under control. It's realizing that I need his power in my life if I'm going to accomplish what he wants me to accomplish. That again is total surrender. Humbling myself before God means I go before him and say, Lord, I really want to see your will accomplished. I really want to see your work done. I really want to see you do something through my life, but I, I can do nothing in, of, in and of myself. It's allowing God to do in your life what he wants to do. Many times people get frustrated because they're trying to accomplish something and it's just not working out. If I humble myself before God, I submit myself to Him, the Bible tells us that, that, uh, that as I surrender to Him, He will accomplish in my life what I could never accomplish. In Ephesians 5.18, He says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That is, allow yourself, surrender yourself to Him, and allow Him uh, allow his Holy Spirit to control you. And when that happens, he will accomplish in your, your life what he wants to accomplish. And you won't have to fret about what isn't getting done. There's a peace there. There is an absolute peace when you humble yourself before God. When you say, Lord, uh, my life is yours. Whatever you want to accomplish, you can accomplish. You don't get frustrated because you're not able to do something. You, you don't get depressed because it didn't go your way because you recognize he is the master, he's the one in control, and he's going to take care of all of these things. So first he tells us, draw nigh to God. He tells us to despise your sin, be afflicted and mourn and weep and pray for, for, for because of the sin that's in this world. Then he says, go before God, humble yourself before him, seek his face. So that, so that he can do a work in you that you could never do yourself. The next thing he says is in verse 11. He says, speak not evil one of another. Let me read it to you. It says, speak not evil one of another. Brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brethren and, and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So, what is he saying? He's saying that you have no right to be criticizing a brother or sister in Jesus Christ. Don't talk bad about somebody behind their back. Don't, be, uh, don't backbite. In fact, if you have something to say about someone, then say it to their face. Several years ago, a man walked into my office and he said, Pastor, I want to talk to you about so-and-so. And he mentioned the person's name. I said, well, wait a minute. Before you talk to me about them, let me get them on the phone so they can hear everything you're going to say. He said, he said well, I don't want him to hear it. And I said, well, if you don't want him to hear it, then don't tell it to me because even if I can't get him on the phone, I'm going to call him up and tell him everything you said. The Bible doesn't ever tell us that it's right to speak evil about somebody to someone else unless... I am going to do something to benefit that person. If, somebody, if a brother or sister is in sin and you want to help them and you say, I want a brother to come with me and talk to them, then that's perfectly fine. As long as you're going not condemning, you're going to help them. The, the idea of 
talking about somebody. Well, somebody might say, well, everything I was going to say was true. Listen, some of the worst gossip in the world is things that's true. Uh, you just have no right to criticize, badmouth, or condemn a brother or sister in Jesus Christ, whether it's just uh, uh, criticism or unjust. The Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. If we have a problem with a brother, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against you, that is if he sins against you, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So if I have a problem with a brother, there's nothing wrong with me seeing that somebody has a, a weakness or a fault but I'm not supposed to go and tell somebody else about my brother's fault. I'm supposed to go to my brother and talk to him. In Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, we're told the same thing. If a brother be overtaken with a fault, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. Man, I can, I can be happy in my life if I pray, if I draw nigh to God, if I, if I uh, get rid of sin, if I humble myself before him, and if I determine I'm not going to speak evil about anyone or any person for any reason. I'm just going to check my tongue. I'm going to make sure that I'm not the person that is speaking evil of others. James repeats this over and over and over again. We saw in James chapter 2 that he says our tongue is like a fire. It's a world of iniquity. It causes great destruction. We need to be careful how we use our tongue. We need to make sure that we are not using it to criticize our brothers. I'm not going to speak evil about someone else, whether they be saved or whether they be unsaved. I mean, there's so much evil that is spoken in this world. It seems that when we're in this hot political season that we're in right now, nobody seems to have anything good to say about anybody else. Don't you be part of that. Just don't be part of that. Check your tongue. Check your heart. Can I look at a politician and say, I don't agree with their position? Yes, but I need to say, say it graciously. I don't need to stand up and say, oh, that jerk, oh, that idiot, that, that, no, that, those kind of things should never come out of my, my, my mouth. I need to check my tongue. I need to be careful that I am not speaking evil of someone else. And then the fifth thing goes hand in hand with that. In verses 11 and 12, it says, speak not evil one of another. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? The idea is very simple. He says, look, don't judge your brother. That's not your job. Your job is to reach out to the lost and show them how to get saved. Your job is to encourage Christian brothers and sisters to do that which is right, not to criticize them, but to, to help them do that which is right. Now, I want to tell you this. There are two Greek words for the word judge. One means to discern. Can I see that a brother or sister is doing something wrong and discern that it is wrong? Can I look at sin in the world and, and discern that certain things are wrong? We, 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 would say, uh, we would say, hey, homosexuality is wrong, and someone would jump up and say, don't judge. We would say adultery is wrong, and someone else would say, don't judge. We would say stealing is wrong, or rioting in the street is wrong, and somebody would say, don't judge. That is uh, that's contrary to Scripture. The word, there is a word that, that is translated judge that means to discern. I need to be able to discern what is right and what is wrong. I can say adultery is wrong. I can say stealing is wrong. I can say that murder is wrong. I can say that rioting is wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. And I can look at an action and say about a particular action, that action is wrong. Now, what I'm not supposed to do 
is judge with condemnation. There's another Greek word which means to condemn. It, it's translated damnation. It means to look at somebody and condemn them. God doesn't want me to condemn anybody. That's not my job. My job is to discern the need and help them come to Jesus Christ. If they're lost, I'm supposed to help them get saved. If they are saved, I'm supposed to help them do that which is right and overcome that, not condemn them, but I'm supposed to bear their burden and help them do that which is right. A man texted me this morning and he said, hey, I'm helping a young man uh, overcome some things in his life. And I, I texted him back and said, that's so wonderful. He sees a young man in need, and he says, I want to help that young man. And we have tools in the church in order to be able to do that. We have discipleship tools. We have the Word of God. We have the opportunity to sit down on a one-on-one -on -one basis and help someone that has a special need. God wants us to do that. In fact, Jesus said, don't be judging others. That's my job. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 22, he said, the Father, that is God the Father, judges no man. God the Father doesn't even judge man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. When you start judging somebody else, he says, and James says, you're not a doer of the law anymore. You're a judge of the law. And Jesus said, look, it's my job to judge. Don't be usurping the position of Jesus Christ. Let Jesus do the judging. Let Jesus do the condemning. And let us you and me do all that we can to reach lost people and encourage Christians. Number six, don't make godless plans. You want to be happy? Don't leave God out of your plans. Look what he says in verse 13 and 14. He says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time then vanisheth away. Wow. Listen, I am all for planning, and I believe that God wants us to plan our days. I believe that God wants us to plan our years, and, and God wants us to be organized and do things decently in order. But let's not leave God out of our plans. Uh, this man is saying, well, I'm just, I'm planning on doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Don't leave God out of your plans. Don't make godless plans. You will not be happy. Listen, you should, your plans should have eternity in mind. If you want to be happy, if you, if you don't want to come to the end of some plan that you, and I, even if I, I've accomplished some great thing and not be disappointed, make sure that God is the center of your plans. Make sure that God, something eternal is part of your, is part of your planning. Years ago, when I was 10 years old, I learned this lesson that when we plan things and we do things in our own flesh, we're often disappointed with the outcome. Uh, we uh, had out in my backyard, my dad had a pigeon coop. And uh, the pigeon, my dad had passed away, and, and the pigeon coop, the, the remains of the pigeon coop were there. And my friends and I uh, decided, hey, we could make that thing into a fort. And uh, so we decided we were going to go around. There was some construction taking place out in back of our, our property. We would go out there and we'd get scrap lumber and we came and we worked for weeks to build this fort. It was going to be our clubhouse. Uh, the roof was already put there because my dad had put this roof up and it, it, it was about a six foot roof. And uh, we, like we're 10 years old, so we're only, we're only four four foot tall or so and it was great we built this put, put walls around there we put a window in there we put a door in there and then we got it all finished and after it was finished we went inside we got a couple of plastic chairs and stuck them inside i can remember i said to my friend i'm going to be the president because it's in my yard and the and the vice president was my next door neighbor and charlie we, he, i said you can be the secretary he said i don't want to be a secretary 
so we called him the sergeant at arms. He was the sergeant at arms. And he said, what, do you, what does that mean? We said, you guard the door. So we went inside and we sat there. And then we thought, okay, so now we got this thing done. What do we do? We got a clubhouse and we just sat in the clubhouse for a little while and we said, you know what? There's no fulfillment in this. We had, we had no plans. It was just a little thing we were going to do, a big thing to us at that time was going to do and and then it was just done that's the emptiness that people feel they'll build a huge home they'll build all sorts of things they think that material things are going to make them happy or that they're going to accomplish some goal and then they reach out to accomplish that goal and they find there's no fulfillment in life because there is no fulfillment in life without God but with God at the center of your life because you've drawn close to him. You've gotten rid of sin. You've humbled yourself before him. You're not speaking evil of others. You're not judging your brothers. Your plan now, your plans are God-centered plans. And whatever you're doing, you get to see God working through you. And that's where contentment comes. That's where you find peace. There are people, there are preachers across this country today who are very, very frustrated. They're frustrated because before the pandemic started, their church was, had numerous people that were coming. Then all of a sudden, they weren't allowed to come. And what, what their satisfaction was, was in knowing that people were going to come to the church and there were a certain number of people and week after week things were growing. Now all of a sudden, that which was they were they were placing their happiness in is gone but if their happiness was was centered on hey i'm doing the will of god i'm doing what god wants me to do day after day week after week i'm doing what god wants me to do then they can still be content today there are people who have lost their businesses and th their happiness is gone why because their happiness wasn't found in their relationship with Jesus Christ, it was based on something they were working for, which would not have brought eternal contentment anyway. What I'm telling you is this. Look, don't, don't have godless plans. Don't live, uh, uh, don't, don't make plans that leave God out. Make him the center of your plans. And I'm telling you, you'll find fulfillment. You'll find happiness. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You know not what's going to be on tomorrow. You know not what's going to be on tomorrow. Your life's like a vapor. It's like a steam kettle, and the steam comes out, and it's gone. It vanishes away. Your life needs to be Christ-centered. Uh, it, it, life is not all about gain. Life is, it, life is not permanent. Life is in God's hands. And if you realize this and you make your life a God-centered life, when you pillow your head at night, you'll have peace and you'll have contentment. You'll have that happiness. You'll have that joy that you need because your joy will be in Jesus, not in what you accomplished or what you did not accomplish. Number seven, seek to do the will of God. In verse 15, he says this, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. My heart should be very simply, God, what is it that you want me to do? Where is it that you want me to go? God, I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I am surrendered to you, to your will, and to your desires for me. God's will is our best option. Jesus knew that in the garden. In the garden, he cried out, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Your surrender to the will of God will bring you contentment like nothing else. It's so important uh, we think that if we get what we want, if we can just get what we want out of life, then I'm going to have peace. That's not, the, that's not the case at all. When you are totally and completely surrendered to Him,
to his word, through his spirit, through uh, surrendering, surrendering to him whatever God uses authorities in your life to tell you. When you surrender to his will, man, you're going to have peace. A peace that passes understanding. College student will come to me and say, I don't know whether it's, my, it's God's will for me to stay in college or not. I say to him, hey, have you asked your parents what they think? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just seeking God's will. I said, go to your parents. Ask your parents what they think, and then do what they think, and then you'll be doing the will of God. Well, how do you know that? Because God's Word, God's Word says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Just, you can know the will of God. Uh, how do I know if, if uh, a wife might say to me, how do I know if I should go here or go there? I say, have you asked your husband? The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, I don't know if he's walking with God. The Bible doesn't say if he's walking with God. The Bible says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband. Ask your husband his opinion. Ask your husband his advice. The Bible tells us that God works through authorities. You surrender to the will of God. You surrender by, to his word. You surrender through his spirit. You surrender to the authorities God has placed over you. And then you allow him to use circumstances to place you where he wants you to be. You don't have to fret. You don't have to worry. You don't have to get frustrated. God is in control. And God wants you to understand that. And you can have happiness. You can have peace. The last thing is this. You want happiness in your life? Number eight, avoid evil and do good. Here's what he says in verse uh, 16 and 17. He says, but now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So what is God saying? God is saying very simply, if it's wrong, if there's any inclination that it's wrong, then don't do it. Stay away from it. Avoid the evil. Determine to do what is good. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22 says, abstain from the very appearance of evil. If, if something appears to be wrong, then don't do it. Years ago, I was in the back of, our, we lived in a mobile home, my mother and I, I was in the back of the mobile home and I yelled out and I had a shirt that I'd worn the day before and I said to my, wife, my mom, is, that thing, is this a dirty shirt or is it clean? And she said, she yelled back at me, David, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. That should be a, like a motto for us. If it's doubtful, then stay away from it. Why should I put myself in a questionable situation when I don't have to? Uh, we shouldn't be asking ourselves what's wrong with a certain thing. We should be asking ourselves what's right about a particular thing. I want to make sure that I'm avoiding evil and I'm going to do that which is good. If I find myself or if I, I think if I go to a certain place that I might encounter evil, I need to avoid it. Uh, if I think that um, my friends are going to be doing something that I, I think might be contrary to the Word of God, I just need to avoid that situation. I want to avoid evil. I don't need to run around condemning anybody else. I just need my, to personally avoid evil and do good. If, I, if I'm watching a television show and I think, well, you know, this thing doesn't seem to be heading in the, in the right direction. I was watching one just yesterday. And I thought, man, uh, this thing has got just so much junk in it. I'm, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, this is not going to head in the right direction. So I finally I just turned it off. I really wanted to see the end of the story. I really wanted to see what was going on. But I don't want to be, I don't want evil to affect me, my life. And so I'm going to do everything I can to avoid evil and just do that which is good. So what have we learned? We see that there are eight keys or eight rules for a happy life. Number one, draw nigh to God. Do that. Do that every day. Number two, uh, be afflicted and mourn over sin. Stay away from sin. Number three, humble yourself in the sight of God. Number four, speak not evil one of another. Just don't, just refuse to be the person that's speaking evil of others. Number five, don't judge your brother. I'm not going to judge my brother. 
I'm not gonna put myself in a position where I'm doing that, that's God's responsibility. Number six, don't make godless plans. I want God to be the center of all of my plans. Number seven, seek to do the will of God. I wanna do what God's will is, not what I wanna do. And then I'm going to avoid evil and I'm gonna do what is good. Man, if I take those things and I apply them to my life, I can have a happy tomorrow. I can have a happy today. I can have joy in my life. Now, the very first thing that I need to do is if I've never trusted Christ, I need to do the will of God. I need to call on Jesus. I need to say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you are God. I know you died for me. You were buried and rose from the dead for me. And I wanna ask you to give me eternal life. The only way a person can know for sure they're going to heaven is by coming to Jesus and asking him to give them eternal life. If you've never done that, I encourage you to do that today. If you are a Christian, and most likely you are if you're watching this, then I encourage you, apply these eight rules for a happy life so you can have the contentment of Jesus Christ in your life. God bless you. I hope to see you in church this Sunday. Thank you for tuning in to Experience Liberty. I want to encourage you and let you know some of the things that are going on at the church now as things are slowly opening up, even in phase two. I want you to know what's available for you. I, I recently sent out a letter to, to let everyone know what we have available. Let me, let me just share with you a few things. Uh, first of all, I want you to know that on Sunday morning we do have services uh, uh, at 8 o'clock at 9.45 and at 11.15. Then at 1.15, we have a Spanish service. All of these services are, uh, uh, are conducted in a way that we have social distancing. We have provided six feet of social distancing. We've, uh, we've sanitized the entire buildings between the services. We sanitize each bathroom after use. And uh, we ask if you have COVID-19 or are ill not to come. But it's been really neat to be able to re get re-engaged with the people of God and to church together with God's people. I encourage you uh, to come on a regular basis. Then uh, if you're, again, if you are in our Spanish ministry, we have the uh, 1.30 Spanish service that's available for you. We also have done some wonderful things in the last couple of weeks. On Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock in this auditorium, we have our youth department, and we encourage you to bring your youth department, be part of the uh, Wednesday evening youth fellowship that starts at 7 o'clock and goes from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. That's for children or for teenagers between the ages of 13 and 18. Every Wednesday morning and every Saturday morning from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, we have Camp Liberty. We used to have Camp Liberty on Sunday mornings, but we can't do that and, and still abide by the social distancing uh, uh, conditions. And so what we've done is we do that on, on Wednesday morning from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. We have the same program on Saturday morning from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And we can handle up to 150 kids. You need to register or reserve your spot for that. And we hope that you'll come and be part of that. We also have Bible studies throughout the week. We have uh, Jamie Allen's Bible study uh, every, uh, every, Thursday, or every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, every Thursday at 6.30, we have Rick and Jenny uh, Burkett's Bible, uh, Bible class. On Saturday at 6 p.m., we have Steve and Christina Livingston. Uh, again, all of these are in the church auditorium. On Thursday at 9 a.m., we have John and Jan Shore's class as for our senior saints and for those that are involved in music ministry. And then uh, on Saturday at 6 p.m., uh, we, have, we have Bruce and Crystal Delcado have an off-site Bible study. And then John and Faith Gelsthorpe have a Bible study on Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. So all of these are available to you. Also, our single adults every Saturday evening meet at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, Pastor Matt and uh, Brianna teach that, and that's off-site, and so you need to get in touch with the church office. If you've not been involved in any of these Bible studies, you need to get together with other Christians. You should, uh, you should do everything you can to get involved in one of these Bible studies or be here in services. I also want to encourage you to continue to look online. You will see we have uh, Shine devotionals every day online. 
uh, Monday through Saturday. And they all go hand in hand with what I'm preaching on on Sunday morning. This will be a great help to you. And we just want to keep encouraging you as Christians to continue to grow in Jesus Christ. All of this is for you. We care about you. We want you to know that we love you. And we are praying for you. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday in church.